Mind-controlled prosthetics. We've all seen them in movies, right? They feel like something we should already have, but so far, they've been out of reach for most. The problem isn't that scientists and engineers can't make them. It's that the crucial link between an artificial limb and the mind needs to be restored in a way that turns that hardware into human wear. In this episode of Re-Engineering Radio, you'll learn how research participant Karen lost her hand past her wrist and what University of Michigan researchers are doing to bring back the intuitive control through her nerves. Karen was feeling the onset of something, a head cold perhaps, even before she and her friends set off for a weekend in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She shrugged it aside, figuring over-the-counter meds and burners would see her through. As the days passed, her friends suggested a trip to urgent care, but Karen refused. Today, Karen remembers very little from that point on, until a police officer began knocking on her window. It was a welfare check after her friend had been unable to reach her. When Karen was unable to pull herself out of bed, the officer climbed in through the window. She remembered, the officer asked me, are you okay? I said no. An emergency room doctor at the local hospital estimated Karen had five hours to live. A urinary tract infection had become sepsis and triggered kidney failure. Doctors were able to stabilize Karen and have her moved to the ICU. At some point, they began giving her calcium chloride via an IV in her right hand. In a span of 20 minutes, Karen's hand began to turn blue and purple. The crook of her elbow looked black. She woke up and appeared to be trying to tell people in the room something, but the ventilator tubes controlling her breathing kept her from speaking. A nurse brought over a letter board to help Karen communicate. Nobody could figure out what I was trying to say, she said. After the fact, my sister said, now, looking back, it was like you were trying to say, my hand, my hand. Karen remembers the ICU filled with strange faces, hand specialists, blood specialists, orthopedists. The calcium chloride line had been hastily removed. An ultrasound technician scanned her arm, looking for artery damage and blood flow. That's when the talk turned to amputation. The orthopedic surgeon told me he was going to have to remove three fingers and part of the thumb, she said. His hope at that point was for me to have a pinching grasp. At home, with three fewer fingers and half a thumb, Karen waited. Despite doctor visits and rehab, the hand refused to move when she willed it to. She met with a surgeon to consider a tendon transfer, but the prospects were daunting. She was told it would take four or five surgeries and there was no guarantee she would have any function at all. The discussion eventually turned to a full amputation of the hand. She was referred to Paul Soderna, Robert O'Neill, Professor of Plastic Surgery. He's also University of Michigan's Chief of Plastic Surgery. When the complete amputation was performed, Soderna also used the opportunity to remove a piece of muscle tissue from Karen's leg for an RPNI graft. It was one door closing, in a sense, and another opening up. The finality of saying goodbye to her hand for good was a huge, weighty thing, leading to days where she couldn't even look at it without breaking down. Her willingness to participate in University of Michigan research, however, is much more in line with the positive person she is. I told them, sure, I'd love to help out, she remembered. It sounds fascinating and exciting. And it's a good way to move forward, not only for me, but as a way of helping other people. Limitless good humor, Karen can rattle off hundreds of things she took for granted before losing her right hand to amputation three years ago. A well-formed meatball would be nice, one you can roll and properly shape between the palms of your hands, or ponytails, just because you feel like doing something different with your hair once in a while. Delve a bit further, however, and you get a sense of how deep her loss goes. Her job at a Jackson, Michigan injection molding plant was a hands-on manual labor gig she loved. It gave her a purpose, friends, an income, and a sense of identity. Now she lives off a mixture of social security, disability, and long-term disability that all adds up to less than she earned before. It feeds a cycle of withdrawal from socializing, going out in public, and, frankly, being Karen. I go to my appointments, she said. I'll go over to a friend's house or a family member's house. I go and get groceries, 
but I don't really go out in public much. How much of what has been lost can be recovered? How much physical capability can science give back to amputees? A revolutionary connection between human and machine is emerging at the University of Michigan, a new interface that amplifies signals from the brain, allowing them to control smart prosthetics at a level not seen before. We're trying to connect advanced hand prosthetics to the nervous system so people can just think about moving them and they move, said Cindy Chestek, a UM associate professor of biomedical engineering. She added, the only thing that can control, really intuitively control these prosthetics is the nervous system. Harnessing the nervous system has fallen to a University of Michigan team that involves as many as 10 different disciplines at any given time. Engineers and doctors are working hard to raise the bar for what Karen and others like her can hope for. And there are plenty of others. Roughly 185,000 people from all walks of life lose limbs each year for a variety of reasons, including cancer, infection, and traumatic injury. And sometimes, as Karen's story shows, they lose them for what seems like no reason at all. Paul Sederna, a professor of plastic surgery at the University of Michigan, said, If someone suffers an injury that results in limb loss, it seems like such a failure for you as a surgeon because you couldn't save it, even if it wasn't salvageable. For the patient, the loss is devastating and life-changing. But if you can provide them with functional restoration in a way... You can grab victory from defeat. You can restore them back to where they were, make them whole. Depending on your age, you might remember Steve Austin, the $6 million man. His bionic legs, eye and right arm, gave him the ability to do all kinds of 1970-ish jumping, punching, and kicking, albeit always in slow motion. Less than a decade later, you could see Luke Skywalker getting a robotic right hand to replace the one lopped off by, of all people, his own father. More recently, Hollywood has brought us Marvel's Winter Soldier with a full left-arm prosthesis capable of mayhem. The gap between what we see on screen and what we can offer real people who have lost a limb remains wide, and the disconnect comes from an inability to effectively capture signals sent by the brain to peripheral nerves in the body. As Paul Sederna puts it, the problem with most of the technologies we have for interfacing with peripheral nerves is that the signals are really tiny. You have tiny little peripheral nerve signals along with noise, both at about the same level. So when you try to hear what the peripheral nerve is saying, you actually can't. Attempts to capture those signals have taken different forms. Some researchers attach cuff electrodes to nerve endings to pick up signals. Others go directly to the brain, implanting electrodes there. In most cases, the signal-to-noise ratio remains weak. Theodore Kung is an assistant professor of plastic surgery and a member of Paul Sederna's team. It's not really stable or reliable, he said. Sensors and nerve endings are biologically incompatible. If you try to put anything electric onto the nerve itself, you get a lot of scarring, which leads to a loss of signal fidelity. Not a great strategy for a long-term answer. In 2006, a University of Michigan team led by Sederna was headed down a similar path using neural probes for a U.S. Department of Defense project. An early presentation didn't get far. As Sederna recalls it, the Department of Defense program manager slammed his fist on the table and said, when are people going to stop stuffing nails into nerves? I didn't give you millions of dollars to put electrodes into nerves. Team regrouped, focusing on the fact nerves naturally want to grow into environments like skin and muscle, a process we call re Dominoes started falling quickly from there, leading to the idea of Regenerative Peripheral Nerve Interfaces, or RPNIs. Encasing nerve endings with a small graft of tissue has an effect that's similar to plugging a guitar into an amplifier. The technique is a major leap forward, moving past signal-to-noise ratio problems that have confounded previous efforts at capturing the brain's intentions. Paul Sederna said, When a tiny little signal comes down from the brain through the nerve, it goes into the muscle graft and becomes a huge muscle signal. That allows us to detect even the tiniest little motion somebody wants to produce in a limb, while at the same time being able to completely ignore the noise around it. It's just after 1 p.m. on October 24th, 2018, and operating room 11 at the University of Michigan Hospital has drawn a crowd. A dozen or more people are shuttling in and out, 
some here to assist while others came to watch Sederna and his team implant electrodes in Karen's arm. These sensor conductors will, hopefully, detect electrical signals sent from the brain toward Karen's missing hand and deliver them to devices outside the body. A year earlier, the team created RPNIs by wrapping muscle from Karen's leg around nerves in her forearm. Sederna's day has already been eventful. His morning included hours of surgery on a six-year-old with facial burns. After a quick lunch at his desk, he walks into the surgical suite. All right, he says to the group, let's get this show on the road. Today's task is to anchor electrodes within those graphs and run signal-carrying wires up through Karen's arm and out through a patch of skin near her shoulder. Karen, the second patient to undergo this procedure, comes in with plenty of hope but few guarantees. She maneuvers her day-to-day -day life with a body-powered prosthetic that slides over her residual limb and ends in a two-pronged pincer. She'd love to boost her sense of control over things and herself, and even if she can't benefit personally from this process, she hopes others will. Electrodes will be attached to five muscles in her forearm. In addition, three electrodes will be connected to previously implanted RPNIs. Philip Vu is a biomedical engineer, part of the chest deck lab. He said, these nerves are made up of smaller cables if you want to think of it that way. Each smaller cable has its own functionality. Usually, Sederna will leave the nerve intact and then place the muscle graph, the RPNI, without separating the individual nerve branches. Vu added, but with Karen, we're separating one of her nerves because we want to see if we can get more functionality out of the graphs. The electrodes themselves look like a tiny hook trailing lengths of gray sewing thread. These hooks secure the electrode in the RPNI where the sensor can read signals from the brain amplified in the muscle tissue. Once secured, Sederna and his team carefully run the electrode wires up through the inside of Karen's arm. It requires caution to prevent damage, but it will be far less cumbersome for patients down the road. When it's time to interact with monitors, computers, or a prosthetic, they need only a simple hookup. In the future, signals captured by the RPNI will be transmitted to the prosthetic wirelessly, making the experience even easier for patients and without any external evidence of what's going on inside. After more than 90 minutes of work, Sederna steps away, allowing Dr. Kung to implant more electrodes. That's two out of eight, Sederna says. Six to go. Every few minutes or so, caught up in the moment and forgetting anyone's around, Professor Chestek hops. She's in a repurposed office at University Hospital, one of a half dozen people crammed in to watch Karen get hooked up to an electronic prosthetic hand for the first time. These are tiny hops of excitement, complete with triumphant hand gestures and poorly muffled expressions of joy. It's a week after Thanksgiving and the goal is clear, to see how well the electrodes in Karen's forearm are capturing signals from the brain. And if the hops are to be believed, things are going well. During a break in the action, Chestek said, to my knowledge, these may be the biggest signals ever recorded from a nerve. RPNIs produce signal to noise ratios that regularly hit 30 or more, far stronger than the 2 to 3 generated by a typical cuff electrode attached to a nerve. As Chestek says, at that level, the noise is being dwarfed by the signal. All the little things that can mess you up stop messing you up. Back inside, Karen sits in a desk chair in front of a computer. Her Uggs are barely reaching the floor. To the left of the screen, the prosthetic hand sits upright in a stand, palm facing her, like it's about to wave hello. Wires from the implanted electrodes emerge from Karen's upper arm just beneath the shoulder. Nearby, they connect with the computer where signal strength is relayed on screen in a moving graph. Peaks and valleys pass by as she follows instructions to move one finger or flex another. Philip Vu mixes things up a little bit by having the computer screen show an animated hand respond to the signals picked up by the sensor inside Karen's RPNI. He instructs her to move a particular finger and, perhaps a second or two later, the animation responds, mostly with the proper movement. Finally, Vu tries sending the signals through to the prosthetic hand sitting two feet away. Karen can, for the first time, control the prosthetic directly doesn't produce a eureka moment, but it is fascinating to watch. The prosthetic moves in place of a hand and fingers that were lost more than two years ago. Afterward, Karen says, it was amazing. I've watched YouTube videos of all types of robotic hands and I'd be amazed at how they work. 
just now in that little room doing it myself, I was like, wow, this is what it could be like if I had one of these. Joe would think about moving the fingers of his right hand and the prosthetic moved accordingly. The thought process, if that's the right phrase, was the same for the most part, no more or no less deliberate. After losing his right arm in a fireworks accident in 2013, he was the first patient to undergo both the RPNI surgery and have the electrodes implanted in his arm. After months of practice, controlling the prosthetic became second nature, or perhaps closer to first. Joe said, if you'd wanted me to do something specific with the hand or do certain patterns with it, I might have to think about the movement to make sure I was moving the right digits. But it was just like I was normally doing it on my left hand. There was almost no thought involved whatsoever. Getting to that stage, however, requires high-tech help. Electrodes pick up the electrical current, energy, without a specific purpose. Machine learning allows a computer to act as a translator of sorts. Theodore Kung, a member of Sederna's surgical team, said, there's a word called transduction in biology, which means you take one signal and convert it into another different signal. In the body, he continued, the brain sends a small neural signal to the nerve saying, move your foot. The connection between the nerve and surrounding muscle transduces the nerve signal to a muscle signal, which is much larger. In Michigan's RPNI recipients, the electrodes pick up the signal, but they have no clue what it means. As Kung said, it's not specific and it doesn't need to be. Figuring out what the nerve is trying to say, working backwards, that's what Cindy Chestek and the computer engineering people are doing. Working backwards involves plenty of repetition. Joe spent hours upon hours being given commands to move his missing right hand in a specific way. Connected to a computer, the electrodes recorded the corresponding activity and used it to train an algorithm. Once adequately trained, the subject's profile can be uploaded to operate a prosthetic, allowing for immediate use. A person's signals are likely to change with the passage of time. With electrode implants that remain in the body, that means periodic retraining of the algorithm. But with continued streamlining of the system, researchers hope retraining would only be necessary every few years. Cindy Chestek said, This worked the very first time we tried it. There's no learning. All of the learning happens in our algorithms. We don't require learning on the part of our participant. Samuel peers out of a 150-year-old black-and-white photo with what's left of his arms crossed in front of him. Both hands have been amputated at the wrist. Strapped to each arm is a prosthetic device of his own design, mechanical creations that end in a two-pronged pincer. Given that he created them in the 1860s, his body-powered prosthetics are a marvel. For members of the University of Michigan's research team, however, the photo is a source of frustration, a sobering look at how far we haven't come. Simplistic hooks or pincers still do the lion's share of the work for amputees, yet better functionality is tantalizingly close. Steve Kemp is an assistant professor of plastic surgery at the University of Michigan. He said, It's not like we don't have these better robotic arms. When I see all of the crazy inventions, these Terminator arms, and then you see today's amputees still using a hook, it drives me insane. The missing link has been the interface linking brain and prosthetic. Cindy Chestek said, Five years ago, the prosthetic hands were better than the control signals that we had for them. I think we now have leapfrogged that, where the signals we can get are actually for more finer movements than the hands are capable of. So this, I think, is strong motivation for prosthetic hand companies to develop better hands. Even when done in a surgical setting, the loss of a limb is traumatic. Skin, bone, blood vessels, and nerves are all severed usually as a last resort. It's particularly problematic for bundles of nerves left behind. Given nothing to grow into, nerve ends thicken into tumor-like masses called neuromas. They are often extremely painful. Following his accident, Joe experienced neuroma pain so intense he underwent surgery at a local hospital to remove them. But in a short time, they simply grew back. As he puts it, with the neuromas, if you'd so much as brushed your hand against my right arm, it would hurt so bad that I'd want to hit you. My arm couldn't come into contact with anything, and that included prosthetics. 
The prospect of relief in the form of RP and I's was too good to pass up. As Joe said, I was at the point where the pain was so bad I was willing to try just about anything. The relief after the RP and I surgery was immediate. The idea of grafting muscle onto the nerve ends came out of tissue engineering experiments Siderna and surgeon Melanie Urbanchik performed for many years. What Siderna realized is that muscles want to grow and nerves want something to grow into. Give them both what they want and neuromas won't develop. It's a key benefit of the RPNI approach. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates people with physical disabilities are two to four times more likely to have a substance abuse problem than the general population. AddictionCenter.com is an online clearinghouse for addiction information resources. It states, A disability and lack of support can easily discourage someone's happiness and sense of purpose in life, creating depressing states. Co-occurring disorders like depression, anxiety, and an unhealed trauma are especially common among disabled Americans, leading many to seek a false sense of comfort with harmful substances. Soderna's original interest in RPNIs was to capture and amplify brain signals, not manage pain. Call it a very happy accident. As he says, the beautiful thing about that is that we successfully treat their neuroma and we take care of their pain. But then we also set them up for high-end prosthetics devices and eventually having the ability to control them. By mid-May, Joe no longer has the electrodes in his arm. He's finished assisting the University of Michigan's team for now and works full-time at a municipal water department. His hopes for the research remain high. Eventually, he'd like to get a call to return to Ann Arbor for a final surgery to implant wireless electrodes in his forearm, clearing the way for him to take home an advanced prosthetic hand. Let's just say his relationship with his current farmer's hand hook prosthetic isn't great. As he puts it, I can't open a door with it, but it's what my insurance covers, unfortunately. It's about good enough to be a hammer, and that's about it. I've not been able to use it successfully to grab onto anything or work with it. Karen's work with the University of Michigan continues. In a typical week, she'll make the 90-mile drive back and forth from Jackson to Ann Arbor twice. She remains, nearly always, upbeat, even as she struggles to adapt to the changes in her life. Cindy Chestek and Paul Zaderna want better than struggling, for Karen, Joe, and the thousands of potential beneficiaries they haven't met yet. That means pushing toward clinical trials for hand prosthetics. It means initiating testing to utilize RPNIs with leg amputations. It means investigating RPNIs as controls for exoskeletons. It could also mean transforming prosthetic hands from things that merely receive signals from the brain into things that can be used to send signals back. Chestek and Sederna believe sensors in the prosthetic will be able to detect pressure and temperature, things that can be translated and returned to the brain. Call it restoring the sense of touch, and it's something that's already produced results during Karen's experiments. Cindy Chestek said, If you're really serious about trying to give someone their hand back, it has to feel like a hand. Eventually, you're going to have to have sensation. Chestek continued, we can electrically create action potentials that go to her brain, and Karen's interpreting that. The caveat right now is that it always feels artificial, which means it's one of a thousand challenges that remain ahead before the Michigan team can reach the goal that underlies all of this. As Sederna says, we think we can give them their life back. Thanks for listening. And hey, one more thing before you go. Please subscribe to Re-Engineering Radio. And if you have a minute, drop us a review. See you next time. <laughs>